Hi, and thanks for tuning in. Today is going to be the first in a series of videos where we discuss our immune system. Our immune system, of course, is a system put in, that's evolved to help protect us from infections and invading pathogens. It's going to involve barriers and cells and all kinds of different responses that our body utilizes in order to rid off or prevent our infections. Now, the immune system is also remarkably complex, and as such, it's going to warrant a good deal of discussion about the various processes that occur in order to keep us healthy and defend off infections. I recommend watching the videos in the order in which they are going to be put on YouTube. I think this will give you the clearest picture of what's going on. I will also start every video by talking about how this is the first or the second or the third video in the series. So there are three different layers of the immune system, and that's what we're going to introduce today. So stay tuned as we start to explore our complex and wonderful and amazing immune system. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. Today we're going to start our conversation about the immune system by talking about the different lines of defense that make up your immune system. So your immune system is this remarkably complex series of barriers and cells and proteinaceous responses that are utilized to help keep things from, from getting inside of your body, as well as, as fighting off pathogens that may make it past those barriers and get inside and potentially cause an infection. So what I want to talk about today are the three different lines. And what we'll learn today is that there are three lines of defense. The first two represent part of your innate immune system. So your innate immune system is sort of nonspecific and just sort of separates the world between things that are supposed to be in your body and things that aren't. Then you have your adaptive immune system, which makes up the third line of defense, which really confers a good deal of specificity. It identifies exactly what it is that's invading your body and provides very specialized cells and antibodies and such to help rid your body of those pathogens. The other key component of the adaptive immune system, or the third line of defense, uh, is memory. So this is where your immunologic memory also takes place. So let's start talking about each of the lines of defense in order and what they represent and how they function. So the first line of defense is part of the innate immune system. And in fact, the first line of defense does not truly represent any type of response to an invader uh, in any way, shape, or form. In fact, the first line of defense really are just barriers. So these are going to be things like your skin, your mucocilia escalator, your mucus, tears, saliva, uh, your mi normal microbiota, even your genetic makeup. All of these things represent your first line of defense. And the goal of the first line of defense is to prevent things from making it inside of your body in the first place. So for example, your skin is made up of, of several layers of cells that help to coat almost your entire body. The cool part about your skin is that your skin actually sloughs off. And if there are things that are attached to the outer portion of your body and those skin cells begin to slough off, it's called desquamation. Same thing happens with your hair. Um, if these things fall out, they take those, those bacteria with them. They also prevent things from making it inside of your body. So if something wants to make it inside of your body, it's going to have to, for the most part, breach that cutaneous layer and get inside of the tissues. Things like tears and saliva, those are packed with different enzymes and things like lysozyme uh, and lactoferrin and ferritin, which are iron scavenging proteins that can actually help to uh, fend off bacteria or at least prevent them, pre prevent them from infecting your body. We often don't think about genetics as part of a line of defense at all, but in fact it is. Because remember, uh, your ability to respond to various infections, as we'll learn, is really controlled at the genetic level. If you have genetic uh, disorders that perhaps prevent certain parts of your immune system from being produced or functioning appropriately, you're going to be much more susceptible to infections. Your neural microbiota, while not truly yours in the sense that they are made up of other living organisms, your microbiota is an essential component of your immune system. The fact that these cells are present not only help to aid in digestion to keep you healthy, but also act to train your immune system. They, uh, they affect how your immune system responds to certain things. And the fact that these things are antagonistic with potential pathogens and help to fight alongside your body to get rid of them is extremely helpful to you. Now, again, the first line of defense truly represents barriers. We're just trying to prevent things from making it into your body in the first place so that they can't harm you. But what happens if something breaches the first line of defense? What happens if something makes it into a tissue, makes it into your bloodstream? What then? Well, that's when we reach the second line of defense. Now, the second line of defense is actually going to represent a response. It's going to either involve proteins or it's going to involve cells. So we kind of break it down that way. 
So when we talk about what types of cells are going to be involved, well, we're going to talk about cells like macrophages and neutrophils and dendritic cells that are called phagocytes. So one component of the second layer of defense is phagocytosis, cells that eat other cells and help to destroy other cells. Now, the thing to remember about these innate immune cells is they don't really have any degree of specificity. You can think about it this way. They look at the world and say something is either self and belongs in the body or it's foreign and doesn't belong in the body. And they have little receptors on their surface that help to decide whether something is either foreign and should be removed or part of the self and should be retained. So another key component of your second line of defense is inflammation. We tend to think of inflammation as a bad thing, but it's actually a necessary component of your body's ability, uh, of your body's response to invasion, and it's also necessary for your body to repair itself. So inflammation is characterized by five key things. It's going to be characterized by swelling, warmth, redness, pain, and loss of function. So uh, inflammation is actually mediated by a number of cells in your body that release inflammatory cytokines. So these could be things like histamine or bradykinin, but it can also be things like interleukins and, and tissue necrosis factor. The key thing about inflammation is it's going to help uh, make your, uh, your blood vessels a little bit more permeable. In other words, it's going to allow things to leave the bloodstream to make it into tissues where they can help to fight off the infection and repair the damage. Without inflammation, things like antibodies and T cells and natural killer cells and neutrophils would never be able to exit the bloodstream and make it into the tissue to help fight off the infection. So while we tend to think of inflammation in its chronic sense, which can be painful and bad, without inflammation, without that red, warm swelling, uh, there really wouldn't be a way for your body to not only fight off an infection, but to repair the damage that may have been caused by it. Another component of the second line of defense are antimicrobial proteins. So these are proteins that can be produced by your body that help to fight off infections. So these can be things like interferon. Interferon is a cool protein that's produced by cells that are stressed. Um, quite often these are cells that are either cancerous or often can be cells that are infected by a virus. So if a cell gets infected by a virus, it will actually start producing interferon, then secrete it into, this, into the tissue and warn nearby cells that, yep, I've been infected by a virus and guess what's gonna happen? If I can't find a way to destroy this virus or myself, eventually there's gonna be a lot more virus running around and you're gonna be infected next. It actually puts the remaining cells in the tissue on alert for the fact that there could actually be a viral infection and that they need to start preparing themselves so that they don't get hijacked and become a factory to produce more viruses. Interferon has actually been utilized in medicine to help treat off cancer, as well as several other viral infections. For example, hepatitis. Interferon is a very common treatment used to treat off hepatitis or treat hepatitis infections. There are other antimicrobial proteins include complement. So complement might very well be the most important uh, proteinaceous defense system you've never heard of. Uh, complement is a series of proteins uh, that interact with each other. They can actually form membrane attack complexes on the surface of cells that can punch holes in their membrane that can kill off bacteria and fungi and other invading pathogens by destro destroying the selective permeability of their membrane. But they also play several other key roles, as we'll learn. They can help label things as, as potential pathogens so that your macrophages and other phagocytes can remove them. And they're also essential for, uh, for activating B cells, which we'll learn are part of the third line of defense and are the cells that produce antibodies. There are also proteins called antimicrobial peptides. Uh, these have sort of a detergent-like property, and they insert themselves in the membranes of bacterial cells, ruining their selective permeability, and can also act to help destroy pathogens. Another component of the second line of defense is fever. And again, fever is one of those things that we tend to associate negatively, but fever is actually an incredibly protective mechanism that your body has evolved in order to fight off infections. So fever, of course, if it's too high, if it's, if it's too prolonged, can potentially be harmful to the host. You can actually burn up with fever and it could be potentially fatal. There are some infections that actually cause such high fevers that it, it, can, uh, it can cause uh, problems like things like seizures and, 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 and other problems in the people that have it. Now, that being said, overall, fever is an important component of your body's immune response. So for example, by increasing your body's temperature by even a few degrees, that can actually act to inhibit the growth of certain temperature sensitive microbes. Certain viruses, for example, certain fungi can't survive in the presence of an elevated body temperature, or at least they won't divide. That gives your body time to come along and to fight off those infections. Fever also triggers your body into sort of a defensive state. 
uh, a fever can actually initiate hematopoiesis. In other words, it upregulates your body's production of blood cells. These include, include, of course, red blood cells, but also the white blood cells, things like your phagocytes and things like uh, T cells and B cells that are needed to help fight off the infection. It also increases the activity of a number of other antimicrobial pr proteins. These are, these are iron scavenging proteins such as ferritin, lactoferrin, and transferritin. These three proteins are iron scavenging proteins that actually uh, your body produces during an infection to help bind up all the free iron that's available. Main reason why is bacteria want that iron. They need it as an important enzymatic cofactor. And if your body can deny that iron to those bacteria, it can greatly slow down their ability to reproduce and survive. In fact, it's so important to bacteria that many of them have actually produced an enzyme called a siderophore. And the siderophore is an enzyme that can actually rip iron away from your iron binding proteins um, and, and sort of a competition to get that limited resource that's present in your body. So while fever can be problematic if the fever is too high grade or if it lasts for too long, overall, fever is a pretty protective mechanism that helps to basically put your entire body on an alert status and an ability to fight off an infection. So quite often we do see a fever uh, associated with many different infections. This is simply your body's natural response uh, and it's trying to put your body on a war footing so that it can actually fight off whatever is invading it. So finally, let's talk about the third line of defense and this is the last line of defense. Now the first two lines of defense, as we spoke about before, are part of the innate immune system. So the innate immune system sort of separates the world into things that belong in our body, self, and things that don't, not self. And if it doesn't belong in our body, the, the general way it gets rid of it is to sort of eat it or to destroy it. The third line of defense represents the adaptive or specific immune system. And this is going to be comprised of cells. So this is cell mediated immunity. It involves two types of cells, your T cells and your B cells. Now, as we'll learn in a subsequent video, there are different types of T cells and there are different types of B cells. But the big thing to, to understand is that T cells and B cells interact with specific pathogens. More specifically, they interact with specific antigens called their cognate antigen. And the fact that they possess receptors called T cell receptors and B cell receptors to confer such specific immunity against certain things is very, very important. These are our specialized weapons. And the end goal in the case of a severe infection is to activate the third line of defense because they are going to give us our killer T cells, which are our body's best way of fighting off a viral infection. They're going to give us B cells that can produce antibodies, which are specialized proteins that target, spe that target specific antigens and thereby target specific pathogens that enter our body and help to identify and destroy them and make it easier for our innate immune system to do their job. Again, all of this is accomplished through the two key characteristics of the third line of defense, specificity, and then finally, memory. And the big thing is, is that your body can produce memory T cells and memory B cells that can help remember a particular infection. This immunologic memory is why vaccinations work. It's why being exposed to, to some infection can make it much harder for you to get that infection in the future. These memory cells, these memory T cells, and these memory B cells lay in place in your body after you've been exposed to an infection or been vaccinated against something. And then when that thing shows back up, whatever that particular pathogen happens to be, your body already has the ability to say, I remember what this is, and now I can respond faster. I can respond stronger. And that's why things like flu shots work because your body's able to respond faster. That's why when you get your MMR vaccine, the chances of you getting measles, mumps, or rubella is very, very low in the future because your body's formed in immunologic memory. They've formed memory B cells and memory T cells that lie in wait in case you're ever exposed to those pathogens again, and then can fight back by the production of antibodies and killer T cells and helper T cells and so on and so forth. We'll talk at great length about the different cells that make up the third line of defense, as well as the cells that make up the second line of defense in a subsequent video. Thank you all so much for tuning in today. Like I said, today is just video one of a series of videos on the immune system. Today we introduced the lines of defense, the first line of defense, which is barriers that help prevent things from getting into our body. The second line of defense, another layer of innate immunity, where we have things like phagocytes that help to eat things. We have antimicrobial proteins, we have inflammation, we have fever. And then finally, the third line of defense, our line of adaptive immunity that involves T cells and B cells. In our next video, we'll be talking about the different cells that make up our immune system, whether they're innate immune cells or adaptive immune cells. Thank you guys so much for tuning in today. I hope you learned a lot and I will talk to you soon.